so besides me having broken the game with the most OP build in the world, what else are we doing? Uh, I didn't want to spend gold upgrading because I didn't have a lot. This seems nice. This also seems really good. Uh, that seems kind of crap. I'm just looking at the gem slash because if it doesn't have blue, I don't think I care about it. Oh. What are my current gloves? These give really shitty stats, at least from my understanding. These seems better, but here I can use green upgrade gems and here I can use blue and red. Uh, I don't know man. This gives a lot of energy shield, then I become immortal. That seems fine. Maximum energy shield also seems good. Uh, I think we have so much, so many crops and shit. We can just send that. Set sail. Can I deposit this? Yes, I can deposit money like this. Good. But is there any... Okay. So my problem seems to be that I am refining all the ore in the world. And I maybe shouldn't. Can grow pumpkins, okay. I don't have a need for pumpkins. Mm. Okay. Here we also need all. So I think it makes sense to stop the smelting. Can smell petrified amber, yeah, that's, that's cool, bro, but don't really need. So that's removed. So now I have two guys not doing anything. Seems useless, but hey. It is what it is. Then gear wise, I think we put this one on. Ah, uh, so we doubled upgraded that one. But if we do this, frost blink, put it maybe there. So our raging spirits will still be flaming. And I think we can, it's not ideal, but then we'll increase the speed of our skeletons. I actually like the other setup better, but eh. This is fine. It's fine. And then do I have any cool green gems? Cold snap. What about 
Support melee strike skills. Does that work on minions? Probably not. It sounds cool. But there's no slot to put this in. Does that mean need to do it like this? Then I have fireball. Oops. That's fine. I don't really care about fireball. Uh. Burning arrow. Nah. That's not really any of these gems I think sounds cool. Let's not waste our time on that. Curious why I cannot see my quests, but I ah, guess it is what it is, man. Search blah 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 something for so essence essentially we go up there and then either way we will find something we can do. Sure. Uh, I still haven't really figured out how to move my spells around. So, they will still stay on their default place. Hopefully I can get a skill that makes my temporary pets permanent. That would be amazing. I would love that. Instead of this constantly summoning shit. What is this box down here? Like too easy, man. Too easy. I like the concept that Diablo is trying to do now where it drops less loot, but it drops like the loot that actually drops is in theory at least more interesting or that's the goal they're trying to hit whether that's how it was like how whether that's actually how it works or not i don't really know but i like the idea it's a good concept whereas here like there's so much trash loot and i know you can set a filter up and everything and I think you can set up a super complicated filter um, just because you can do everything complicated in, in path, in PoE. Yeah. When I was younger, I really wanted to work in game development. And I remember one time I applied at IO Interactive here in Copenhagen as a QA developer, because that's almost one of the only entrance jobs which exist. And then you can use like, you have a chance of trying to transition to different roles and after a while and so on. So I went to the interview and 
they had me do a test, so they sat me down in front of an Xbox and I had to play, I don't remember, Kanan Lynch or something like that. And at that point, that was before I kind of admitted to myself I needed contacts. So for whatever reason, I, I, I and I wasn't sure how developed the game was. So I had, I was testing the game for 30 minutes and then afterwards they wanted me to write like QA, like try to write some QA descriptions or whatever without any guidance or info on how it's supposed to be done. Um, to be honest, that seems relatively normal in game, in the gaming industry where you don't really teach people or mentor them or anything. Because the people wanting to work in game development, there's so many. There's a lot more people wanting to work in game development than there's job jobs for game developers uh, for any position. So I played the game for 30 minutes and I just got stuck in this bar they had. And I was like, oh, there's something wrong here. So I just tested every fucking thing inside the bar but I never made it outside of the bar and I have no idea if I was supposed to go further than that or not but I started shooting bottles in the background and I started jumping on people and I started shooting people and like I tried to interact with everything and just to try to test something because what the fuck are you gonna test inside a bar um, it was probably one of the most boring half hours of my life and then writing everything afterwards it was like well this seemed like this didn't work you could do it like that when I when I shot inside the bar people were just running in circles that seemed unrealistic like oh like unbelievable why don't you make them run away from you instead of just rain running in random circles um, and just Lots of things like, long story short, I didn't get a callback. They also didn't tell me, like, they didn't give me any pointers to tell me why I failed. I was also so young, so I didn't ask. It was just, I think at that point I was just embarrassed that I didn't do better. Which, I don't know, is also one of the triggers for me realizing I need contacts. Because when you cannot see what's on a TV relatively close to you, like that's as a hint. When yeah, I, like it didn't really deter me from working in game development though. I it just made me study more up on what's required and and what positions exist and so on and is it like how do you apply for them so my decision or like I kind of figured out figured I wanted to be a game designer um I don't know because I like making decisions or, and make experiences and such but I also read that it was close to impossible to get like an entry level job as a uh, as a game designer. So based on that, I was like, okay, then it doesn't even make sense to try to apply for jobs. Fuck that. So what I did instead to become a game designer was that I made my own company um, because I had a developer background. I was a full stack developer at the time. So I was like, yeah, well, sure. We'll just make our own company and then earn some money doing like enterprise coding or enterprise development, normal coding shit. And then make a profit off that and then slowly funnel money into like a savings account for our game development. And in between clients, we could do games as well. So we did that. Like we jumped out straight after our bachelor, me and my buddy made our own IT company, started doing shit. 
Uh, it was not as easy as I had thought, uh, naively. It also wasn't as hard as I, as it could have been, to be fair. Like the first year, we didn't make any money, like at all, because at that point we were actually three guys, and it was like the third guy's responsibility to get clients, um, or that was what we hoped, and. And then me and the other developer dude, we would deliver like the projects and do game development. But no sales really came in and we had a very, like we had one client from our uh, bachelor days. We started working on clients during the bachelor. Um, so we had that client still and they wanted minor things here and there, but it wasn't anything big and the hours was too cheap. Uh, not ridiculously cheap, but not expensive enough to actually make a saving. Uh, maybe if we had worked full time on them for like a long period of time, it could have made sense. But for minor projects, it just didn't really make sense. But we got some experience and some money here and there and something to write on the company resume and a little bit of word of mouth. So after a year of not making any money, I think we decided to, I like guess at some point we decided to get rid of the third guy because it really wasn't creating any value. And it was demotivating having a third guy who didn't bring anything to the company. Uh, and we were all good friends, so it was a really shitty decision having to made, make and it was a shitty conversation uh, having to have had. Um, but yeah. We did it, we bought him out, and I don't know if everything was good, but at least everybody kind of moved on. And then, yeah, as time went on, our strategy was just to survive, essentially, because as long as the company survived, we had more time to find more clients, and all our clients kept coming back to us, at least. So we never lost a client during that time. They were always happy with our work and they kept coming back. It was just the prices weren't what they should be uh, for us to make, like for it to be a really interesting job. Um, and it was hard to hire people on those salaries. So we just worked a lot ourselves and because of the prices and so on, it was also not really realistic to put anything into savings to do game development. But as time moved, yeah, as time moved on, one day we got this random fucking email where I was like, this is 100% a scam, like this doesn't make any sense. But it was basically a guy who was like, hey, I saw your profile on, on the, on one of the, job seeking pages or like work for hire pages and I saw you guys do unity too and like I have a lot of ideas for games and I want to do games but I don't know how to code and I cannot do graphics and I don't really do design but I have some money so I can fund it like oh okay that sounds interesting uh, and then like the conception or like our perception was that this is like 100% gonna be a waste of our time. This is not gonna be anything. Like who the fuck just makes a post like that? It's weird. Um, so, but we also wanted to do games, right? So at that point we were like, yeah, well, if it's a scam, then, or if it doesn't really mount out to anything, who cares? Then we wasted like 30 minutes of a meeting or something. Like it's not the end of the world. So we actually set up a meeting with this guy who sent a random email and we set up the meeting for the day after. So we went and met him at this cafe close to our office. And he was rel like he was relatively young, not like a couple of years older than us at the point. Um, 
and he seemed nice and everything and he wanted us to do a a demo or a prototype for a kind of like for an idea he had and we came up with a price which was higher than our standard uh, and it was a good price for us based on the work that had to be delivered and it was a good price for him as well um, so by the day after we actually had a contract signed and now we were game developers so it was what the fuck it was really weird how that like went from um, like struggling and not doing any game design for a year or two to now we suddenly had a contract with a random dude who who had some money and who wanted to do game design so now we had to deliver this prototype in three months yeah we like it didn't take a lot of time to go from that to uh, let's get a contract signed because like we wanted we wanted to work in game design we wanted money and it was just a all win-win for everybody in involved and we wanted to move fast so just like that we became game developers so to speak and then like our when we started uh, development uh, scam to game design. What the fuck? <laughs> um, <laughs> when it um, when we started coding, it was like we were majoring in game development, so we did have experience with it, and we had done stuff ourselves as well. But we had never released anything, uh, which is a very fucking important part of game development as any developer out there will testify to. If you haven't released anything, uh, it doesn't really count. Like it's really hard to argue that whatever prototype you have made counts for anything if it hasn't been released. Like there's so much knowledge, knowledge that you haven't gained at that point. Um, this Seems good. Nah, fuck. But so now we had three months to actually deliver this prototype we agreed to, and it was a very, it was a relatively fluffy contract, if we are all being honest. As you might have guessed, there weren't too many lawyers involved in it, and so it was a very much a, like a nod and a handshake. What the fuck, that's a lot of access. So we set about to deliver this prototype and... And we... We delivered it in three months and he was happy with it, we were happy with it. And then we agreed to expand the prototype to like... To a proper game. Um, and yeah, and build on top of it, make it bigger, make it better. And that's where shit started going downhill. Because we were... I don't know if arrogant is the right word to use here, but we were definitely inexperienced and we underestimated or maybe we overestimated our own abilities so our logic with a lot of coding is like and a lot of projects were that of course we can deliver it like if it's possible we can deliver it like we've never had a project we couldn't deliver on before it's just a matter of figuring out what you need to do read some documentation maybe like all problems can be solved and if we spend enough time on a problem we can solve it like that was our logic so going into it like going from a prototype with no basically no graphics and just a proof of concept 
to token specs with the client whereas like he he wanted everything in the world and maybe it's fair to mention it was a mobile game this will come in relevant very soon he wanted basically what's unreal engine 5 graphics today for everything and he wanted everything to be like super pretty and super cool which is understandable and we didn't have the experience to tell him no this is unrealistic this will require a huge fucking team this will cost a lot more money than you think it will and it will not give you the value that you are seeking um so unfortunately we went along with a lot of the things like yes it will be a huge fucking map let's instead of just having like this size map let's make it fucking this big um and let's let's have it so these players can build their own uh, roads and shit and customize things and let's do let's let's have super advanced logic for the movement and so on because things were not allowed to collide um so jesus right things in the game wasn't allowed to they could collide they weren't allowed to die or anything but they weren't allowed to pass through each other and that was a huge fucking problem when you have roads and the roads get packed up with shit and they're not allowed to just drive through each other then now all of a sudden like we need logic to figure out what do you do when there's heavy tra traffic and everything is blocking each other how do we handle that and all the ideas we suggested didn't gel with the client because um, essentially he wanted it as a very realistic game and and everything had to work the same way the real world works and the real world is very complicated to say the least so we had to introduce a lot of rules and a lot of logic and so on that just it just bloated the lot like the code base and the rules and the complexity and the time to develop along with the graphic fidelity and the client wanted and and just scope like and just having the opinion that we can deliver everything so there's no need to be too worried about scope um so like in the end it kind of turned to shit to be honest and it was like i i think a lot of it was on our shoulders because we didn't know enough and yeah i wish i could go back and do that project today with the knowledge I have now because we could deliver a much better product in a much shorter time and actually start getting a revenue and then build up a business for the client um, yeah but live and learn in the end the big game with Unreal 5 graphics didn't really turn like we made a lot of things and we ended up scaling the team to i think we were eight developers like including artists and uh, animators and so on working on it at some point including myself which was a lot going from like two people not doing anything to um, having to hire and manage eight people doing game development and and trying to understand 3d and how does that work and interact and how what does a 3d artist need to deliver so a unity developer can implement it properly and how do we keep performance high while delivering really pretty 3d on a mobile device and how does that work on ios and what what do we need to do different on android what problems are there here and there um 
what is the easiest way of maintaining UI, for example, and update icons. And there's a lot of headaches that goes into game development that people don't understand. And it's not like you're not supposed to understand it either. Like I don't understand cars either mechanics and I don't want to, I just want to pay someone to get it done. But shit takes a long time and the budget and everything can bloat really, really fast if people aren't on top of their shit. And a lot of the time it's hard to stay on top of the shit because you don't need to just know one part of the process. You need to know how everything works together. Like, like I said, how does artist works for development and how does the development choices affect the artist? How does the pipeline for art actually works? And if you choose this pipeline, how will that affect performance and everything else and so on? Hugely complicated. It's a huge shit show. Um, but in the end, we couldn't deliver on the promises to the client. Um, like, and we we agreed with the client we would scale it back to simpler graphics and and then focus on performance and do less realistic logic and so on to get to a timeline that's more realistic and a budget. So we started focusing on that and then after a month or so the client was unhappy we hadn't remade the game with the new graphics and performance yet and so on. So we decided to can that project and then split it up and make two other smaller games with all the assets and things we had made. So we never got to release the big game that we initially set out to make with this client. But on the bright side, we did get to release two smaller games, um, which kind of captured um, a lot of the essence and the um, like the spirit of the bigger game. So I'm happy with that. I and I think we made some nice smaller games. Uh, yeah, but after that, we also agreed with the client that 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 was the end of our adventure together, and we would go our separate ways, which honestly was the best for both parties because at that point we had like there had been so many con conflicts and just unhappiness all the, like all the way around that it was a very um, unhappy work environment I guess and there was just yeah there was too many discussions and frictions and so on to for it to make sense moving forward uh, but for our like from our perspective it, uh, it was nice we managed to release two games it was nice we got a lot of experience we got to build up a team at the same time we were also like we had like two legs in the business we had the game development and we had more like normal web development. So at that time we were like 12 employees and and I think we had run the company for six or seven years at that time. Uh, and, um, and around that time we sold the company to another um, consulting company and then we had to learn like to hand over the team and like integrate with with their rules, their systems and hand over projects, move our developers onto like their projects and and so on and so on. It was also a fun experience. Um, and it was quite interesting to to try to see what happens when you merge two companies and what kind of friction, like what kind of unexpected friction happens, um, what shouldn't stay as unto like unspoken expectations and how important alignment is. 
because at some point it can be the smallest things that can create friction. It's like, of course it was like, it was them who acquired us, so, and that was the agreement and so on. It's, um, so it was, it was them, like it was their, like our new parent company who had final say in everything, which makes completely sense. Like that's what they paid for. Um, yeah. So it was quite an interesting journey, like building my own company and going from just being a new developer out of out of uni to building my own company, having a team of twelve employees that I manage and find job for, and doing game development, doing web development trying to network as hard as I can, reaching out to everybody, like, yeah, doing way more than I ever expected I would do. Um, it gave me a lot of good experiences and I have a very broad knowledge base at this point. Also because during, during those seven years where I had my own company, I, I was fortunately in, fortunate enough to work a hundred hours a week. So I got a lot of experience in a lot of random roles. Um, where most people, they just get a lot of experience in one or two roles. Um, but I, like, I have so much experience as like scrum master, product owner, agile coach is kind of the same thing. And then project manager, developer, game designer, uh, UI, UX, stakeholder management, um, like business management, l leadership, blah, 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 blah. Like the list just, the list is quite long, too long. Uh, but it has given me a, a lot of knowledge and a lot of, a very wide perspective whenever I I consider and encounter problems. Um, it, it's it makes it really easy for me to find solutions and dig down because I can easily see a problem from from multiple angles, and I know solving one problem for developers might create another problem for uh, for for another department. And compared to someone who like excels in development and who has been the best developer for 10 years and only done development and so on, when they get promoted to like a tech lead or a engineering manager position or like some kind of team management position, now they have to learn all of these other things that is not coding related. And most of the time they're only really passionate about coding. So now they have to do all these things they don't really care about and stakeholder management, people skills and like all of that annoying thing that most developers don't want to do. And then it's always a conflict and a clash and it's interesting to see these de like these like superb developers who are really good and highly skilled having to talk to people and figure out like your job is no longer coding and almost every hour you spend coding is a waste of your time you should spend your time much more on planning and management and stakeholder management and figuring out how do we improve work processes and so on and yeah it's rare they want to do that Any of these, like I'm just reading titles at this point. Uh, none of them sound cool. Multiplies damage over time and increases skill effect. You and yeah, you and yeah, blah blah blah. Nah. Curses all enemies. No. 
Cursed enemies know you are nearby have additional energy shield. No. Curse. Uh, this is just. Maybe this one is okay. Because it, it might keep my skelly boys alive for longer. You're nearby. You're nearby non minion allies, so that's useless. I don't. That's too much text. Too much text. So this one seems like the best. Like, to some extent, we started our game studio when I was reading, uh, when I was getting my AP degree in computer science, because part of the exam we had there was that we needed to go into, like, what is it, like, internship or something like that. And you could either go intern at a company and like I was a bit of a slagger so I was too lazy to go find a company to intern at uh, so the alternative was that you could intern in your own company like your own theoretical company so me and two of my friends that I lived with at the time we just decided to intern in our own company because then we didn't have to go out and do anything it seemed super simple so we we found a name for the uh, we got a name for the company and like you were supposed to take it seriously as if you actually started a company. So we did that. We did take it seriously, and we got the name. We did. Uh, Where's this? The slums. Where do I go into the slums? Um, blah, blah blah we got the name we did everything so the first three months we were committed as fuck to be fair we would spend like we had okay so we lived together at the time and we had put our computers in the living room so we were sitting right next to each other like 24 7 and we knew what each other was doing and so on and we have fixed work hours, like we would start work at this time and we would work. I think we had agreed to only work six hours a day. Um, but we always worked more than that. And, and we produced so much in that time. We were very focused and very concentrated. Um, I was doing art for the game because we needed some someone to do art. Uh, and... The other guy who was better at art than me, he was also our best developer. And since he was a like a coder, coding a education, we needed some proper code. And I was fine not writing code, even though like that kind of put me behind uh, skill wise. Um, but that's what we chose. So I was I was learning how to draw in these three months and I was making the art and so on and so on and learning how the fuck does that work how do I split how do I actually make 2d sprites how do what do I need to do so they can be imported how do I eat most like how do I work most efficiently and how like how can I make my own life easier as an artist all of a sudden and so on anyway we produced a lot of shit. We actually got really, really far with the game. And we were like, okay, we're gonna finish this game in like, uh, I think we had like four or five months. Um, like we had one semester where we were interning. So it was like, we, we're doing well. We are really doing well. So at that point we start having to write the report, like the exams report. And then we meet up with with the 
Ah, do I need to read this? Yeah. Two things. Physical damage. That seems worse. Um, then we meet up with our advisor, I guess it is. And, and he tells us, yeah, now you... Now you've gotten so far and so on, so now you need to start writing the report that you need to hand in. Cool, no problem. We have a lot of code we can write about and so on. And then he said the most demotiv demotivating thing we've ever heard was that anything you've made so far, you cannot include it in the report. Um, and we're like, what? But we're almost done with the game. Like, there's not a lot of things left to do. So if we cannot include this, then what the fuck are we going to write about in our report? It doesn't make any sense. But rules are rules, that's how it is. And then we just immediately lost all motivation and it just went from us working diligently, being super dedicated to us doing fucking nothing and not working on the game or anything. Um, and we just all slumped down into some kind of mini depression or something. And then, then we got closer and closer to the point where we actually had to finish the report and hand something in. And then we just kind of agreed, well, we haven't really made anything new. And honestly, they don't know how far we were with the project and neither does the, like, I don't know what it's called in English, but like there's an external teacher coming in to check our exams in Denmark. So it's not only the teachers we know, but there's a, a an unbiased uh, teacher there as well. And they have no fucking idea what's new and what's not. So. We just wrote our report based on the thing we had made in the first three months and we were told we weren't allowed to include. And yeah, we just, I wrote most of the report because I'm good at writing those kind of things. Uh, and the others were really not interested in writing those kind of things. I th like our main developer, I had to force him to write like two pages about the code just so he had something to talk about during the exam because otherwise I feared he would really f like he wouldn't know what to talk about during the exam and he wouldn't own any part of the report so it would make it really hard for him and it would hurt his grade uh, but it was a fucking drag trying to get him to to own <laughs> any part of that report but I forced him to do it and I whipped him into shape and it got done. And we handed in the report, everything was good and we actually got like, I think we got an A on it. Uh, and like I got a higher grade than the others because I'm, I'm better at presenting and reading a room and saying the right things and so on. So I think they got a B and I got an A. Uh, we yeah we were obviously graded individually, like shared grade on the report and then the presentation is individual grade. So back then we already had the company and we wanted to continue. We had a game, we had an IP, and uh, yeah, so the, the game company kind of already started back then. How do I get here? Am I just completely missing something? Or am I supposed to go through the crematorium? No, I'm not. Then I don't know what's going on here. So this is blocked, that area. And this area is blocked too. Hmm. What is going on here? And I don't think I saw anything over here where I came from. 
I'm so confused. Then maybe there's a, there's something right here. That would be annoying. Or is it this? Is it that little door? Okay, it wasn't here. That's. I don't know if that's good. So I came out of there, I guess, and then. Seems like I have to go through that. Could have saved a lot of time. So, sewers. Yeah, okay. I've worked on so many like random projects and like for clients and uh, just personal hobby projects. I've worked on tax projects and like uh, publishing things, uh, portfolio management, like stock brokerage, investment and such, and like city planning. Uh, games, obviously, different kind of games. We also did uh, like game development consultancy, so we were hired into different teams to help them, uh, like when they needed extra resources for a short amount of time and didn't want to hire someone or couldn't find someone to hire with the right skills. We worked on projects for like the Danish train, like national train organization, whatever it's called. A lot of random things. And what I found true in all the different projects and so on is that you can always find something interesting or something fun. It's up to it's up to yourself to make it work fun in a lot of ways. At least this kind of job I can always make fun because I like solving problems and it rarely matters to me what kind of problem I'm solving. It's always interesting. And there's always there's always weird problems everywhere that you need to solve and you need to understand how the game mechanics of that industry works and what what resources does the company have available uh, how fast can you do different things based on the available resources like budget people time and so on and what is the return on that investment Wait. Am I supposed to... So this is just a dead end. Did I do something here? Was I supposed... Su supposed? Was I supposed to do something? Okay. Oh. What the fuck is a hideout? What is this? Is this like the old version of a city? Crafting bench. I don't understand what, what we're doing now and how is our hideout different? 
editing. Jesus Christ. This. Use the crafting bench in your hideout. Okay. It must be this one. Uh. Increased movement speed. That sounds decent, to be fair. I guess the easiest would be to make a shield or something. Are shields the only thing I can have offhand? Yeah. Uh, it has maximum mana and mana regeneration. Gee, okay. At least I don't have to worry about all of that. Remove, okay. Intelligence. Evasion and energy, blah, blah, blah. Increased energy shield. Max mana. I honestly don't really use that much mana. And 17 to 22. Okay. So what happens here? Prefix and then suffix. Intelligence. Do I do this? Oh. Okay. So I'm not crafting a new item. I'm buffing an existing item or something. I think that's the way I want to look at it. So I can... Okay. Uh, maybe this one is good. Yeah. That did give me quite a good boost. Can I do anything with my shoes? I don't see the point of getting more intelligence. I'm smart enough as is. Okay. Increased armor and energy shield. So I guess this is better. Yeah, I guess. Oh, okay. Yeah. I have a shit ton of energy shield. Activate the Ica pump to begin the blight encounter. What? Is that something I do in here? No. No, it's not right. That must be somewhere else. Okay. Activate the Ica pump to begin this strange, strange encounter. Where? Like, is it in here? Is there anything? Am I missing something? I'm so confused. Because this crafting bench is quite fucking obvious. And there's an icon on the map and everything, but. There's nothing else. It does look like it could become a pump at some point. It doesn't look like a pump now. Hmm. Then we go sewers.
Mm. Didn't know you could edit your Twitch screen layout thingy. That was quite nice. Cool. Do I start there? Save layout. Then why why did you just reset it? Edit layout. Just did all of this. Silly Twitch. Silly, silly Twitch. Okay. That was a super fungy way of doing it. That's a polite way of saying that. Mm. Hideout unlocked, yes. Strength growth, yes. Is it this one? Because that does look weird. Okay. Am I done? Do I need to do things? Oh. So it's a tower defense kind of thing. But who cares? I'm just gonna do the raging heads and then I'm gonna kill everything. It's not gonna be difficult at all. Oh shit, they're down here as well. Uh. Okay, so maybe it was a little bit more difficult than expected. So did I just fail that there's no do-over? Uh, am I gonna be able to do this again or it's just like a one-time thing? Hello? Game? It's also unfair they came from two directions, like, that, that wasn't obvious at all. That completely took me by surprise. I feel cheated. Should we try to figure out what is the next thingy we're gonna go for. Maybe these two. Uh, it would be quite easy to do that. This one might be good too. Oh, I think definitely we go that one. Yeah, this one up here gives us small pets, and that's what I want, so that's most likely what we'll do. Lightning Walker. Boring! Uh, ravenous Horde, increased movement speed, that sounds really good. Indomitable army, that sounds cool too. The effects doesn't sound cool, but the name is nice. It's fine. Desecrated, blah blah. Nah. Nah. Are you living next to a train track? Yeah. 
Was it very loud? I guess it was. I was hoping most of that background noise wouldn't be um, caught by the mic anymore. That's a fun background sound. Hmm. Can you hear the annoying kid as well? Like I have, we have this kid walking around or playing whatever outside. And he just goes, so fucking annoying. Okay, I'll try to turn the mic down a little bit. See if that's better. I'm so disappointed that I cannot try this one again. Now you got me curious. Almost sounds like... Like, sounds like what? What are you gonna say? Almost sounds like someone getting hurt. Yeah. And he just does it like... He does it random times of the day. And he can just do it for a long time. Under city hideout. Someone getting hurt. Is your mental health? Yeah. I think that kid is hurting my mental health. But there must be something wrong with him. Like, you cannot just go around saying, Wah, eh. like, that's the only thing. And being so loud about it. And doing it so often, like that that just ain't normal, bro. But kids are weird. He could just be a fucking moron. I remember as a kid sometimes you picked up a word or a sound or something and you thought it was the funniest thing in the world to just repeat that forever and then that's the only thing you would say for a while and I'm sure it pissed off every, like all adults around you that it was the only noise coming out of you. Travel to the sun encampment, but that was back somewhere else. Uh, fuck. And the marketplace. Okay, so the marketplace has a waypoint. So let's find that waypoint. And then we might call it a day. Motherfucker. I don't... I, I've been seeing this meme on Reddit about the... Shooter guy from Turkey or something. And I have no idea what, what it's all about. It just seems... Yeah, so random. But I saw South Korea did really well in the gunny gun shooty. And America did poorly. Which is surprising, like, how can you have an, have an entire nation known for loving guns and then not winning a single uh, medal at the Olympics? Like, that's just weird, man. Like, your whole belief system is all about the Second Amendment and the right to own firearms and guns and so on, but you don't even know how to fucking use them. Like, then what's the point? How can countries who doesn't have access to guns be much better at shooting? Like, it makes no sense. It 
just weird, man. They know when to shoot for real? I don't know, man. If you see the videos about cops in America just shooting random people because an Akon fell next to them or some shit like that, I know, I'm not convinced. Oh, you mean the other countries? Yeah. Yeah. I thought you m meant like they knew when to shoot when it mattered. Like life and death situations. But yeah. I wasn't sold on that. But I get it now. Why didn't I assign people over here earlier when we had two people unassigned? That seems weird. How's the sailing going? 16 minutes, then it's done. Yeah, hello. Like someone went to your backyard. Is that loud? Petrified amber. So that's the thing they're harvesting now. So I can upgrade that tomorrow. Then you can shoot, yeah. Yeah, and the whole, what is it? Stand your ground law in Texas or whatever it is, where you can shoot people if they f if they force you to move yourself or something like that. Like it's so fucking weird, man. Like it's weird how the rest of the world does need guns to stay safe. It's uh, yeah. Sometimes I think about that, man. Like how come the rest of the world is so much safer and we don't carry guns all the time? Like how does that work? I've seen a real firearm once in my life, in my entire life, and that was when I had like a like party uh, as a teenager when my parents went home, and we we threw a party. We invited some friends, and some of them invited some of their friends, and it kind of became people who. I didn't know and then one of the guys who came that I didn't know he apparently brought a gun and was showing it to people and like yeah fucking idiot but that's the only time I've seen a gun in real life other than that I've never seen one and I've never felt the need to have one and I've always been safer knowing that people around me aren't carrying guns all the time and just because I get into a complication with someone if that happens then um, the default answer isn't to pull a gun so yeah I like that seems nice don't know anyone who's been shot Dirk. And of course there's the argument that criminals will get guns anyway. And to some extent that is true. And to some extent it's also not true. Because why would you get a gun if nobody else has a gun? Like, at some point it becomes an arms race. Like, you need to have a gun because everybody else have a gun. 
Um, so you cannot convince someone to do what you want if you don't have a gun. But if nobody has a gun, you don't need to have a gun to convince someone of doing something. Then the force of violence can be enough. And that is ironically safer that you just say, I'm going to beat you up if you don't give me your money. Um, because the victim isn't suddenly going to pull a gun. So you don't need that gun to protect yourself. You just need to be bigger and stronger and meaner. And that is less lethal. Whereas when you know everybody is carrying a gun, you also fear for your life all the time. Like at any point you're doing criminal activities, whatever. Um, there's always the chance of someone pulling a gun on you and killing you. But like robbing a store in Denmark, for example, the cashier isn't going to have a gun. Like they're going to have nothing and they're just going to do what you say and be like, yeah, have a great day. Uh, I call the police. Good luck. Have fun. So they don't need that threat of violence or anything. Uh, so a lot less people die here because, yeah, everybody doesn't have a gun and we don't start shooting each other as soon as something happens. Like the police have guns and they can do things if they want. But most of the time they don't need guns because they are well trained and they are physically fit to take down people. And criminals don't want to get into a shooting match or shoot cops because that's a lot of jail time compared to not having a gun. So why risk it? It just doesn't make sense. And harder punishment doesn't necessarily reduce crime rate. It just makes criminals more hardened. I think some justice systems focus a lot on punishment and the Scandinavian justice system and maybe more of Europe, I don't know, focus a lot more on rehabilitation. So it's much less about punishing the crime and it's much more about rehabilitating the criminal to turn them into a productive, normal member of society um, so they can start contributing. And I like personally, I like being part of that system. I'm seeing it working um, and there's there's some good cases for it. And it also means we don't have as many like super hardened criminals and gangs to the same extent and so on. Um, but it's not a perfect system either because then you look at Sweden, for example, and as far as I understand, they're dealing with a massive like drug war at the moment and some guy is just fucking up everything. Uh, I'm not really too much on top of it, but yeah, it seems like a shit show. So, essentially, nothing is perfect, um, and I think it all depends on what your value system is and how you how you want to deal with things, um, and yeah, what your ethical compass or whatever moral compass, um, yeah, points towards or whatever you want to say. Okay. Let me figure out what the fuck I'm doing here. So. So I went there and I think I did what I needed to do. So now I need to go back. skill points or passive skill point then we can do more damage and then one more level then we have more pets that's gonna be swag and i like that my pets don't die anymore so i really like game design when when you start off so i okay let's start by saying i generally like pet classes and i like automating things and so on um, but for automation to be fun you need to start out 
like to some extent feel the pain of not automating. Um, so you need to start out by doing things manually and it had, it shouldn't be too annoying, but it should be annoying enough so you want to automate it. And otherwise there's no reward for actually automating it. So I found it immensely annoying having to summon my zombies all the time because they would just die. Two seconds. Okay, I'm I'm on the right path. So I found it immensely annoying having to summon my zombies because they died all the time. But now it seems like they stay alive almost forever without me having to summon them. Which is super nice, that's what I want. Um, so I'm being rewarded by progressing and by playing the game and by assigning my passive skill points to things that enables or empowers my way of playing. So I think that's a really strong uh, game design part of Path of Exile. And to be fair, I'm only 32, like I don't know a lot about this. But so far I'm seeing some really good choices and some really good balancing things. Uh, and I really like it. Most pit classes, because people have like a... People usually have a problem with pit classes because people don't think having a pit do most of the work is as valuable as someone who clicks their own buttons. And I don't know. There, there's a there's some kind of weird pettiness and justice, like internet justice about that. Uh, because then you can get into a discussion then are melee classes superior to range classes because melee is more hardcore you have to take damage or you have a chance of taking damage whereas range is simpler and you can aoe bear and so on like then you get into all kind of weird talks but essentially a lot of people usually agree that pet classes shouldn't be strong because if a pet can deal as much damage as an active player, then players who are active, they feel cheated. So what you usually see from games is that pet classes are either way inferior for whatever reasons, like it could be the pets keep dying or the pets are not allowed to be permanent because then, then the player is active and then then it's okay that the pets um, deal a lot of damage because he summons them and then they last 10 seconds. So that means he needs to click these buttons every 10 seconds when he just wants to have a passive play style. Whatever, I think that's a super weird fucking reasoning, but I think a lot of uh, game studios kind of choose that one. Wait, I'm not supposed to be here. Um, and you see, you see this with the next range in Diablo 3 um, where it has almost no, in my opinion, it has very little permanent pets and the mages are, like they last for 8 seconds or something like that. At, at that point it's just a fucking spell man. Uh, it's just a turret, it's not really a pet. Um, and I think it is to justify that they can actually make an impact on the game uh, and on the fights by dealing damage because the player actively summoned them. Whereas if they were permanent like they were in Diablo 2 for example, people feel it's just... I think they feel cheated. Yeah, whenever a pet class can do the same thing as them without having to click a million buttons. I think that's such a shame because the people wanting to play a pet class and the people wanting to play other classes, they're all looking for different uh, power fantasies and different play styles and they enjoy games differently. And by not being allowed to lean into the pet class power fantasy and the play style, 
you just take away from those players and you don't really give anything to the other players except you kind of piece that pettiness, right? So now they don't have to feel as bad that someone else can do as much damage as them. Um, it's kind of like a spoiled child who sees someone else eating an ice cream and they don't have an ice cream. So to solve the problem, you take away the ice cream from the other child. Because then now nobody has an ice cream and then there's nothing to be sad about. It's, it's not the best way of solving a problem in my opinion. But of course, when you have like a player base of even just a thousand people, um, and obviously Diablo 4 and Path of Exile and similar games have a much bigger player base, but let's just say a thousand people, it's fucking hard to change a thousand people's minds, let alone a million people, or like a two million or ten million. So it's much easier just to appease them, and since pet classes are like, a minority playstyle. I, I, I think it's the fewest people who actually enjoy playing pet classes, and I think that's shown with the amount of pet classes available in most games and how they function. There's a much bigger focus on like the classic, barbarian and wizard, like caster and archer and so on. Like those classic stereotypical uh, archetypes, whereas Whenever you have a pet class, it is most of the time like a unique named pet class. Um, yeah, you like we all know what a barbarian is and we all know what a wizard is. And they are almost... It's really hard to find an RPG which doesn't implement those classes with those names. Or at least those classes with a very similar, like, one of the other possible names we see a lot. Like wizard, sorceress, mage, those kind of things, right? Or barbarian, warrior, fighter. Like, those are three kind of names. You always see them in RPGs. But it's really fucking rare you see a pet class. And when you see a pet class, a lot of the times... It's, it's a unique name because there, there isn't like a, a archetype pet class that are common in RPGs. And I know there are common archetype pet classes. Um, like the Necromancer is a good example. Like almost, I would say everybody who plays RPGs, they know what a Necromancer is. And it is a very... Uh, well-established archetype but it's not a well-established archetype for player like for a playable class it's usually a villain or an like an npc because it's perfectly fine for an npc to have strong pets because we see that in in boss fights a lot anyways when there's ads and similar so that's that's perfectly acceptable and everybody i think a lot of people like the Necromancer as a villain and so on. So it's also hard to make it a playable class because now you play with essentially a villain character and the others are hero types. So that doesn't gel, that doesn't mesh well a lot of times. Diablo has done that well with the lore but I think I can understand why most other games don't want to deal with having to make unique law or really work hard to get a minority class, so to speak, into the game like that makes sense. Um, because at the end of the day, it is really about how many people are you going to make happy by implementing this or that. And if 1% of your player base is going to play the class that you spend 10 or 20 percent of the time implementing then that's not a good return on investment like why would you spend time doing that it wouldn't it doesn't make any sense but you know you know people are going to play barbarian you know people are going to play wizard so of course you're going to implement that i like these three slots 
Um, and I think I'm going... Because this doesn't... Realistically, this doesn't actually give me anything. Like, it gives me plus one level to circuit the gems. Yeah, whoop to do Spell damage? I don't do spells. Cast speed? Meh. Then 19 max life. I have 600. I'm not gonna feel the difference. And then 19 maximum mana. I have almost 500. That's not gonna make a difference. So that doesn't really make a difference for me. Then increase spell damage. Uh, it's low. Physical damage? Meh. So it has the same increased mana, so that does make a difference. And then it has increased mana regeneration. That's gonna be nicer than the health. So we do that. And then... I think... I want to do this, and then I make them Bernie, but they also summon the Phantasms. Cast an elemental... oh yeah, I need to remember to use that. Summon skeletons, but if I make my zombies faster, because my zombies are permanent, then that's gonna be nicer for me, I think. Then it's not as important to uh, actually remember to summon skeletons, which I forget all the time. And I don't think it's fun or interesting to, um, to summon temporary pets. That's not what I wanna do. So I have Burning Minion, which goes to Raging Spirit, and then I have the Phantasms on the Burning Spirits. I think that's the best I can do. Ooh. Now we're taking off, boys. Like, now we're peeking. Now we're gonna have an army. Yeah. So I have no idea what I'm doing down here now. There must be something somewhere. Whoops. Hey, a waypoint. And my sailors came back. Uh, search. Okay, so I need to do something here. So let's finish that. There's a door. Eternal Laboratory. Strength, Dex, Intelligence. What is it? I don't care about intelligence, right? Gives man an energy shield. Uh, then let's do magic fight. That seems cooler. Goodbye. Goodbye. Travel to the docks. That's down there and travel there. Uh, some story. Let's check out this eternal laboratory. Is it just a lot of law? That's gonna be super fucking disappointing. Crafting recipe. Okay. That's probably cool, but I don't care too much about crafting. Okay. Um, want to go to the dirk, so we go to the battlefront. Is there a way for me? Oh, I can move the camera like this. So I probably came in down there. What did I, okay. Fuck. Where did I come in, boys? Did I go in here? Found that. Went over there. 
Is there a way for me to see the names? No, maybe. Uh. Okay, we just do a quick run. We'll just be fast. Gotta go fast. Come in. What is this? What is this? The ducks. Yes! Easy. Find the thermetic sulfide. That's words. That's definitely something. Yes. Now we're cooking, boys. So strong. I think this is even more broken than our last broken build. This is just stupid. And it's only getting better from here. Like, I doubt there's any better build in this game. this is that the thingy yes travel to the Solaris temple there's not a waypoint in here I think so no there is temple level 2 yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't need to Save or try to do anything, I can just take the waypointer. Easy! Easy! Fuck. What is that? Virtue gym is raging, blah 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 blah. I don't know. Okay, so it's just a quest thingy. Travel to the sewers. We saw the sewers somewhere. Oh, okay. Easy. And now we are at the sewers. Oh, isn't this just my hideout? Well, I think called the Undying Blockade, but it died. That's not so undying. I think it should be called the Almost Never Dying. Blockade, but sometimes dying. Um, what makes sense to do? The fuck is this bullshit? Ah, uh, let's upgrade. Our town. Hello. Manage town. This isn't what I wanted. I clicked there. Uh, why didn't I read what the upgrade did before I clicked? Oh well. Okay. I need to identify some stuff. Goat hide boots and a and a yule. Oh, I had these here. I don't know. Mm, evasion. That's kind of shit. Increased. Oh, magic find. I don't know what the rest does. Didn't read it. Didn't care too much. Global crit strike, meh, max life, uh, The other one sounds so much better. Then we just sell. Sell, 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 sell. 
Um, so, can you do anything yet? No. Can you? No. Can anything else do anything? Maximum that. But I need petrified amber bar thingy. Can grow pumpkins, don't care. But I have enough money, I guess. Jesus Christ, that was expensive. Phew. Ralph. Uh, uh, I need to start smelting things. Runesmith using bound runes. I don't fucking know what that means. No. Smelting information. There we go. Need to assign someone. Um, maybe let's go see who we can recruit. There was a smelter guy. Oh. I thought his wage was a hundred an hour. That would have been stupid. So we assign you. You make petrified crimson bars because that's what we need. One every other minute. That's fine. Do I want to add this guy? And then he can make orichalcum bars. Then I think I need more people doing orichalcum. Wait, what? No. Mining orichalcum. Yeah. So we might do it like this. Because it seems like petrified amber thingy. Like that's the thing I'm going to need moving forward. So that's what we're going to focus on. Shipping. Uh, I don't want to... I can sell... No. Did I assign him to do Auricalcum bars? I think I did. Then I can just do this. Mm. Uh, I'm a bit hesitant with this. Fuck it. Let's go. Set soon. Cool. I think that's it for this time. Can we do this next time? Increase effect from offerings, accuracy. I don't understand what most of these things does. But I think we finish out this. Then we might do... Oh, this is nice. Yeah, these two sounds good. So I might do them. And then there was a golem thingy somewhere, right? Golem master. Yeah, golem commander. That might be good when I get a golem. No idea when that happens. But, ah, sounds cool. And what is the best way of getting up there? Would the best way just be to go through here and get it? Seems not great. Minions explode when reduced to low life. Oh. Hmm. Hmm. That might be nice. Let's fire 
to surrounding enemies. Hmm. Okay. Thank you for tuning in, guys. Until next time, take care. Bye.